All right, welcome everybody to week 17, day one. We are now in the final week of school. We've kind of covered all the major topics, so we're going to do uh, topics of general interest to you. It's a long-standing tradition I have in this class. You can ask me any kind of question you want. I'll give you guys a lecture on it. So I've had uh, two questions that I could probably answer uh, today. One is uh, working, basically, in computer science, private sector work. And the other one is on the game development uh, industry. So the uh, first one, I guess I can uh, answer, um, you know, jobs, right? Like, how do you get jobs? And a great way of getting a job is to get like an internship um, while you're in college. Internship. For example, one of my students uh, right now uh, is working for another one of my former students. He came into the previous class actually and talked about his uh, life experiences at, at Berkeley. He's uh, not a student at Berkeley. He is a professional programmer employed by Berkeley to do programming for them because apparently they couldn't find Berkeley students to do programming for him. So that student, uh, a guy by the name of Matthew Mueller, uh, is uh, working for Berkeley and hired one of my students who was a student last semester to, to be an intern for him. And so uh, anything like that, anytime you get a, a cool internship like that, you know, throw yourself into it. And it's a great way to find out if you like the work, if you like the field. Um, don't do um, no unpaid. This is kind of like, don't do an unpaid internship. Um, it's, it, it, might, it might sound a little bit harsh, but basically... Um, Unpaid internships are kind of a scam that a lot of companies do to get free labor out of people and then they don't hire them. Uh, they're kind of illegal in America as well. Uh, technically, unpaid internships are legal if they're actively teaching you, but most of them don't. They just have you do work for them for free. So I would highly avoid this. Um, the only exception to that might be like if you're doing like a project or something like that. Like if you're if you're doing like a project for UC San Francisco or something like that. That is that an unpaid internship? Not exactly, but you might uh, you might want to take that route. So projects is another great way of getting into the jobs industry. Um, so for example, so my students, so two years back, we worked with UC San Francisco here in Fresno, and uh, we made an app that you could punch in people's symptoms, and it would give you a percentage chance uh, that the person had lung cancer versus coccidiomycosis, which is valley fever. They present very similarly, and so a app that could tell a doctor the relative odds that they have coccidiomycosis versus lung cancer is very useful before you go in and biopsy people and stuff like that. So projects like that are pretty cool and are a great way of getting into either industry or into um, academia as well. Uh, so that student Matthew Mueller, uh, Mueller, he is currently programming at Berkeley, working for a Nobel laureate. And he's applying to doctorate programs at MIT and uh, Caltech and places like that. So, um, so those are two good ways. Uh, GitHub is uh, so you can like partner with um, partner with big names is a great uh, way of getting some uh, credentials. You know what I mean? Like working with a Nobel laureate, working with UC San Francisco, the um, you know, one of the best medical and pharmacy schools in, in the world. Uh, partnering with big names is a big thing, or you can just do individual projects, right? And you can do these on GitHub, and a lot of employers want to look at your GitHub account and see what kinds of projects have you made. And they will look at your source code and see if your source code sucks or not, and things like that. So that's a very, uh, that's a very important way of um, kind of selling yourself on your resume. As well, and then when it comes to actually getting a job, uh, my recommendation is you um, um, take forty and forty one, and then start looking for jobs in industry. I, I don't think that you have quite enough knowledge where you are right now, unless you've done you know, you know, actual work before. Most students need forty and forty one. Like you kind of have to understand data structures and have a little bit more um, experience under your belt, and then I would start applying for jobs in tech. Um, jobs outside of tech, they will pay the bills, I guess, but they don't also help. 
So like I had a student who was a manager at Pismos and it was like, that's cool. You know, like you're making good money, but you know, it's not, you know, he wanted to transition in tech, but at the same time, like he was making enough money that it was like, eh, I don't know. And, uh, you know, I have students who work at like movie theaters or Barnes and Nobles, and these don't help you in your tech career. You want to get jobs in tech, any kind of job in tech. It could be doing web development, database work, um, IT kind of is borderline, like, you know, carrying monitors around. It's kind of borderline, but it's kind of like in tech. Um, any, any job you can get where they're paying you to do technology is great because not only does it look good on your resume, but it also uh, teaches you. Like, you learn a lot when you're working, right? And, and you learn that, like, the things you learn in college aren't the same thing that you learn at a job. And it's not like I'm trying to teach you useless. In, in fact, I try to teach you the most useful stuff from my own personal work experience. I, I've worked in a variety of different areas in technology, doing programming in a variety of languages over the years. And, and basically my computer science curriculum here is me trying to crystallize, you know, 27 years of professional programming experience into a few semesters and lessons. And like, these are the important things you have to learn, but every company uh, does things their own way and they have their own, their own stuff and they have their own workflow and stuff like that. And so you will learn quite a lot when you actually work in industry for the first time. And so, uh, another approach you can take is tutoring. Um, the tutorial center is always hiring, uh, competent computer science people. One of the best ways to, to learn, learn by teaching. One of the best ways to learn a topic is to teach it. And I don't think I became like really solid in 40 and 41 until I was a TA for it. And I had to explain it over and over again to people and look at their code and, and figure out what was wrong with it and help them debug it and help them learn. And that really helps you like organize your thoughts and really understand the source material really well. So if you want to become really good at programming, tutor it. Um, you can work for the tutorial center or you can be like one of our tutors on here. Uh, like Hazleton, or let's see who else is on here right now. Mincarelli is here right now. Uh, I guess just Mincarelli right now. You've seen like Bencord and Aaron and things like that. They're not, you know, here like at our tutorial center, but they like helping students and it helps because it helps them learn as well. Oh, there's Aaron. Okay. I didn't see him there. There he is. All right, cool. So, um, cool. Uh, yeah, learning by teaching really, really helps. Um, but in general, like try and get a junior position. That's that's what you guys should be shooting for right now, a junior position. So what is a junior position? It, it means you are partnered to a senior dev. Okay, so that means you have somebody kind of standing over you, like teaching you the ropes. They don't really expect you to know anything. Like anything you know is like a pleasant surprise, but they're basically like, all right, welcome to our company. Here's how we do things. Uh, oh, you've never done database work before. Okay, I'll teach you database stuff. And uh, Zach in the earlier section today said it took him about six months to really get up to speed with the stuff they were doing at his company and about another six months until he felt like he was able to kind of like um, contribute to the um, senior devs when they're having conversations about which way should we go on this and that and the other thing. So, um, so junior positions you wanna look for um, really just 40 and 41 is all you need for that. Like one year of CS is kind of like, uh, really about all you need for that. Some companies will hire you with no experience, but eh, you know, it's it, it, like, if I'm a company, I don't want to teach you what a for loop is. You know what I mean? Like there's, you know what I mean? It's like, like, I, I want you to come in with at least knowing what a variable is and knowing what a function is and knowing what a for, I, like I can work with that. But um, I don't want to have to teach you what a vector is, right? If I'm a, if I'm a company, so about one year of CS is about where, you know, personally I would hire junior developers, um, and then you can grow inside of the company or you can switch companies. So, um, a lot of times companies will train you and kind of hope that like you stick with them, you know, and and like okay, great, you know, you you, you know us, we know you, you're doing great work. We're going to promote you to a dev position. And then after five or seven years, you get promoted to a senior dev and then you kind of like stick with the company. Like that's 
kind of what they're looking for. Like companies kind of hate it when like a junior dev comes in and then they leave. Yeah, you know, which happens. I mean, it happens all the time, right? But like, it's like they it, it takes a lot of time to like onboard somebody, and they don't want ideally people to like thank you for the knowledge and bail, right? Because they have trained you in their company, and now they've got to hire somebody else and train them in the company procedures and and stuff like that. So, do you know anything about Bitwise? Yeah. So, Bitwise is uh, actually probably worth its own bullet point here. So, Bitwise is the Fresno uh, tech hub, I guess you want to call it. Um, Fresno is kind of weird. Like most um, most cities in California have a pretty large tech industry and a tech presence and like, like companies that are like doing tech and there's a pool of developers that like, like can do technology stuff. And Fresno is kind of weird. Like there are actually quite a few people in tech in Fresno, but there's not like any like one like outstanding company here that like everyone's like, oh yeah, I'm going to go to work for Oracle or, or you know, uh, I'm going to work for my, like there's no like big tech giant here in Fresno, which I think is maybe a mistake on the tech giants part because it's cheaper here than in, you know, the Bay Area. But uh, so Bitwise was sort of founded by uh, Jake and Irma to, uh, uh, sort of remedy that situation and to try to grow a tech industry here in Fresno. And that's actually kind of the same reason why I started teaching here at Clovis Community College was because I was kind of like looking around. I'm like, there there really could be, there, there's a need for Fresno to have good technology skills and a good pool of people in technology. And I wanted to be part of like training people to like sort of um, build a tech field here in Fresno from the ground up. So Bitwise has a lot of different components to it. They have a training program where you can go there and take classes. Uh, I don't know if I'd recommend that. I think if you're in a college class, like that's, you know, better, right? Like, it, like the, there are things are like six week boot camps that are like, here's a variable, here's a for loop, here's a function, go. You know, and it's like a real sort of abbreviated computer science training. And, um, you know, one of the things that I've kind of hammered on you guys is that computer science, you, you don't learn it like, it's like learning a language. Like you just have to keep working at it and you have to keep grinding and, and gaining skills and getting better at it and things like that. And so sure, like somebody can know what a for loop is or something after six weeks. Um, but like, like honestly, like going through a two year computer science program here is going to prepare you in my opinion, better than the, uh, like a little six week boot camp, which is again, not bad. I'm not disparaging them. It's just like, you're already here in college. You might as well you know, stick with it. So it's mostly web development also. Yeah, that's also true. Like they really have a hyper focus on teaching people how to do web development. And even still, like a lot of the people that come out of the program have trouble getting jobs and things like that because they have so little um, experience. So um, they also do, um, they also have um, office space. Like uh, Bitwise is technically like a real estate company, right? Like they're, <laughs> So Bitwise, Bitwise does training, you know, and they do, they have classes and things like that. They partnered with FPU. I helped put together FPU software engineering program back in the day. Um, they do training and you know, like boot camps and things like that. Um, uh, but they also have office space. So that's the thing. And so like if you're an independent developer, like if you, uh, if you want to go the indie route, if you don't want to work for a large company, I ran my own consulting company for, for years and, and did quite well. I was making, you know, mid 300s, right? As far as salary goes, running my own consulting company, working about 10 hours a week. So, you know, you can, um, you know, you can, you can do pretty well in tech, right? If, if you have a good reputation for getting work done and things like that, you can make plenty of money and have a very nice work-life balance and things like that. Um, like I said, there's no... Um, you know, there's no need to work for a large company like you're asking about. If, if you're competent, you know, work will find you and then you can kind of set a price. Be like, I'll do that for you for $5,000. Okay, sounds good. It takes me a week. I knock it out. I get 5,000 bucks in my pocket. Good to go. And so one of the things that Bitwise does is they lease office space. So like if you want to have something a little bit more uh, formal than your home office, which I like my home office a lot. I've spent a lot of time you know, building the sit stand desk and the monitors and, and all this kind of stuff. I like my place here, but if 
If you want a place where you can have your own peace and quiet and very high speed internet and things like that, they lease office space to people who are like independent tech contractors and things like that. They do that. And then a really relevant thing to you is um, they have meeting, they have meetups and things like that. And so they host a variety of like uh, events where like people get together. And so if you're like a Linux nerd, you can like Linux nerd out with other Linux nerds. Uh, they also do um, these pizza nights, or at least they used to. I don't know if they've still done it since the pandemic, where like people get together like on the first Friday of every month downtown, and potential employers and potential contractors get together and they get pizza. Like, so what do you do? I'm like, oh, I'm a full stack developer, and they're like, well, I'm looking for a full stack developer. Well, I'm, well, we should go and get coffee. You know, let's talk. You know, and and so they they do these like social mixer events where like people looking for jobs and people offering jobs can get together and actually meet each other and have some face-to-face -face experience with each other uh, rather than the sort of anonymous, like I'm going to apply digitally and they don't know who I am. And yeah, it's, it's a lot nicer, I think, when you know somebody, you know, than um, just sort of blindly applying for a job and they blindly calling people in for interviews and stuff like that. Uh, let's see, they offered a class in beginning HTML, websites, JavaScript, React. Opportunities for Python apprenticeships. They don't teach the skill set. They have to have enough people in the community that already have those skills in order to offer it. We did this game dev boot camp at Bitwise back in seventh grade. It was fun. My first time learning to code. I had a little idea what I was doing. Class are hit or miss because the instructors are all past or current apprentices. Had one instructor who's growth teaching the HTML CSS. Another getting a CS master's and had obvious knowledge for computers and JavaScript. Seemed bad of practice for web development and design aspect. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's, that's kind of their thing. And, um, like if you're, if you're, especially if you're into like the web development world, definitely check them out. Um, personally, I'm not, I don't have interest in web development. It's just, it does not appeal to me. Um, I like doing backend stuff uh, a lot better than front end stuff. And uh, I like doing database work. I like building, you know, engines that will accept requests and do computations and produce results and things like that. Um, so, you know, it's just, it, it kind of depends where your interests lie. Um, as far as skills, if you want to get employed, the top skills that I can recommend for you um, would be SQL or other kind of database stuff. Uh, the good news is you can learn SQL pretty quickly. It's not hard. It's really not. Uh, to get really good at it, it's hard. Um, MongoDB. Um, GitHub practice, yeah, uh, yeah. GitHub is uh, definitely a must-have skill these days. Git or GitHub. GitHub uses Git, um, and so, so like I said, like if you wanna if you wanna get a job, oftentimes employers will ask you for your GitHub page, and they will go on there and they'll look at what kind of projects you've worked on. They can see what kind of code you've written. Uh, they can look at your code and see if you write absolutely terrible code or good code and, and things like that. And just using knowing how to use Git. And GitHub, we talked about this a little bit in this class for like synchronizing uh, the partner partner assignments and things like that. We'll do more of it in forty one. It's very essential. Like uh, any any sort of source management system is good to know, but Git is sort of like the industry standard these days, so it's probably the number one thing that I'd recommend. Uh, yeah, MangoDB, MongoDB, um, and then there's like web things like Firebase that I've used before and. There's, there's a lot of options, but any sort of like database engine that you can like programmatically interact with is good. You can use Microsoft Access. Um, there's just, there's a lot of Postgres SQL, um, MySQL. There's, there's a lot of options in the database world, but it is a very, very, very valuable skill if you want to get a job. It really is. Uh, in fact, Zach, um, you know, he graduated from UC Irvine and, uh, you know, bachelor's degree in computer science. And he's doing database work, you know. So, uh, doesn't Unity have its own push pull system? I don't know. I've I've not messed around with Unity enough. Uh, Unreal Engine uses um, well, it can it can use Git and it can use Git um, large file system LFS. Uh, but they they use their own. Um, I mean, they don't they don't own it, but uh, they have uh, 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 what's it called? I'm blanking on it right now. Um, Perforce, yeah. Um, Perforce is kind of the industry standard in game development. 
And it kind of sucks. Kind of sucks. All of them kind of suck. Like, honestly, like, you know, like, Git kind of sucks. Like, I'm just going to, I'm going to throw that out there. Like, every every major company I know uses Git these days, and all of them have blown off their own foot at, at one point or another. Like, all of them have, like, just screwed up their repository, and they had to call in, like, the Git specialist in the company, and the Git, he's like, how did this even happen? I don't even know. And then they have to, like, re base the entire thing like like all, all source control systems have their issues like they, they really do like i'm not happy really with any of them um yeah you remember pro force aaron so other skills uh i would say um the main programming languages would be c c plus plus java and python and these were all things that uh you're going to come out of this semester knowing at least a little bit of, you know, at least a little bit of C from the C++ that we learned. Uh, you know, a little bit of Java, you know, a little bit of Python if you did the extra credit. So these things are all good. Um, oh, and JavaScript, of course. JavaScript. And uh, there's all sorts of variants that you can have type, TypeScript. And there's all sorts of frameworks like React and things like that. What are your thoughts on Rust? Yeah, Rust is cool. Like... I, I'm really not a hater. Like, I'm really not. Like, in computer science, like, people get super tilted about things. And I, I don't. Like, it's just, like, I'll, I'll note if there's an issue. Like, like Git is great. But, like I said, like, my friend at Microsoft, like, Microsoft's Git, you know, repos would routinely get screwed up. You know, and somebody would have to come in with a nuclear bomb and detonate it and, like, fix everything. You know, like, this is Microsoft. You're like, these aren't, like, random, you know, noobs on the internet or something, you know. Um, Python is getting faster with, what is it, 3.16 coming out right now? It's still slow, though. It's still slow. Like, if you're doing a for loop in Python, you're talking, like, an order of magnitude slower than C++. Um, and so, like, a lot of times you call into a library, and so you'll call into it and have it do the for loop for you, because the, the library is written in C++. Oh, uh, yeah. So, like, maybe Rust. We can put Rust down here, too. Why not? Rust is cool. I like Rust. Um, so... Golang, Swift, I don't know. Um, yep, I don't know. Um, there's got to be some obvious things that I'm missing here. I'm just not thinking of them right now. Uh, I don't know. Interpersonal skills, <laughs> soft skills like. So, uh, you know, most computer science majors uh, don't put enough emphasis on soft skills. Um, like one of my students is like, well, you know, if I'm good, they'll hire me anyway. And it's like, will they? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. You know, he, he you know, this student, uh, you know, was talking on his cell phone loudly in the middle of lecture. Not my lecture, uh, another lecture with 400 people in it. Just openly talking on his phone loudly in Russian. Uh, team collaboration helps as well. Team player is a good thing to consider. Yeah. Knowing when to stop talking is important too. Uh, Summit relays all his activities in Python's group projects. So you can practice social skills. He does give the option to work solo. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he does a lot of um, Pogol activities. Yeah. Um, yeah. Knowing how to email people, showing up on time, like, the, you know, the usual stuff. Um I kind of want to say like Raspberry Pi stuff, but that's kind of more fringe. Um, graphic stuff, maybe. It's a little like gooey stuff. So, like graphical user interfaces, like knowing how to like make a window, how to like get a mouse event, knowing how to like play a sound, you know, uh, just UE design or user experience. Design is like kind of crucial for like most applications. Like I said, I, I personally focus more on backend stuff, but you know, I can I can make a window if I have to. You know, uh, shell scripting. Yes, yeah, that's a good one. Um, that's a good one too. Shell scripting or scripting in general. It doesn't have to be you know shell, but 
Um, so nice. Like Alexandra was like, you know, could you do a, a talk this week on how to like automate stuff? And uh, it's so nice. It is so good to be able to like automate the, the boring stuff. Um, did you happen to post to Canvas a practice activity websites to sharpen skills over this winter break? Uh, no, but I, I uh, remind me if I forget again. Uh, Hacker Rank, Code Wars, Elite Code, uh, just three off the top of my head um, that are good for practicing programming. And then there's like a lot of Zachtronics games that are like programming, but they're video games, but they're programming. They teach you programming skills. Uh, Advent of Code is good. Um, yeah, with GUI stuff, there's like um, SDL. There is SFML. There is Deer in GUI, which I kind of like. Um, there's QD. These are all pretty good things to spend time on actually learning, like for legitimately. Like these are things like over winter break, like run through some tutorials. Um, OpenGL, arguably, maybe, eh, whatever, <laughs> word, um, automate the boring stuff with Python. Yeah, I have a copy of that. Um, Evan to code, um, let's see. So, uh, so how do you, how do you get a job? Like I said, you work on, you work on yourself. Just always be working on self-improvement. Like if I can, if I can really give you any advice, it is always, always work on self-improvement. Like I'm always learning something new. Um, Last semester, I was playing around with like DRM GUI. Um, right now, I'm working with QD, and uh, I've got some software that does something similar to what I want, and it doesn't do exactly what I want. And I'm trying to figure out like the easiest way of like changing the program so I don't have to rewrite this en enormous program from scratch. And uh, I think to a certain extent, I am going to have to just rewrite large chunks of it from scratch. Um, uh, their websites are right here. I don't how ADA accessible it is. Yeah, Canvas actually does that. They have a plugin on Canvas that will test, that'll give you a little score on the accessibility of your stuff. Um, hacker, like um, hackathons or hackathons, uh, game jams. Like sign up for all of these things, uh, coding competitions. Coding competitions really help you get good at programming because you have to code quickly. It really like puts your puts your thoughts in order. Uh, the ACM does coding competitions, but there's um, also like um, um, security, like um, capture the flag events and things like that, like cyber cyber security kind of stuff. Um, hackathons are awesome, but better in person and online. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so just always be working on yourself. Like for me, there's always something in tech. There's technology is such a huge world. Like you, you never run out of like stuff to learn. Right. And so like, I was just like, all right, this, uh, this semester, I want to learn this thing, you know? And then I just start digging into it and watching YouTube tutorials while I'm eating my sandwiches and fire up the code, you know, before I go to sleep and, and just work on it. So just always, always, always be working on yourself, right? Always be trying to develop yourself. Um, the, the worst computer science people are the people that put in the minimum effort on homework and then never like have any curiosity or anything like that. You have to have like a sense of curiosity. You have to have a sense of problem solving. Like I got this problem. There's a thousand different ways to solve it. I need to try and figure out the best way for me to solve it. Um, always be willing to experiment, always be willing to fail. Like that's something that a lot of students have, uh, is a fear of failure because they grew up in like the Columbus Unified School District and are absolutely terrified of like getting a zero on a homework assignment or not getting something done. And, uh, um, you can't be, you, you really can't be like, you have to be like willing to accept failure. Computer science is a large and oftentimes very difficult field. 
Um, so you gotta, uh, you gotta just accept the fact that occasionally you're going to potato on something, you know? And the good thing for having me as a professor is that I do lots of opportunities for extra credit or makeup work, or I'll give you an alternative assignment or something like that. So, uh, or the military. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, in the military, like they have an interesting attitude towards failure, right? Too. So, um, uh, what's well, one of a good grade if you don't understand the concept? Yeah, ultimately what I want is for you to come away from here, like understanding the basics of F40. Okay, um, yeah, so like there's a couple different major career routes that I can maybe recommend to you. It's like career paths. So one is like industry, right? Uh, BS and then into a job, all right? A better route is BS to MS into a job. But you can also go job and then into MS. Uh, I highly recommend that everybody get a bachelor's at a minimum and then ideally get a master's if you can. Like it, it's like, a bachelor's gives you like sort of a basic level of understanding of all the major concepts in computer science and a master's degree deepens all of them to the next level. Uh, I don't think PhDs are particularly worthwhile. Um, but if you are going to go into branch number two, which is research, you kind of have to have a PhD to play the game, right? So there's the great game of um, you get your BS, you get your PhD, you join a lab, and then you like get grant money. And then at some point you uh, become a professor and then you get more grant money and then you get your own lab and then you get more money and you work like 10 hours a week and oversee large groups of people. Uh, the, the, the kicker though is like this grant money is like competitive, right? All the PhD candidates out there are all, they're all competing for the same pot of gold. And so like you got to, yeah, you got to actually have good writing skills, believe it or not. And so you join, yeah, this is join a lab and then you make your own lab, you know, when you, when you got it made. So like, you know, I worked in the lab of Fran Berman, who uh, was a professor at UCSD that ended up becoming the head of the San Diego Supercomputer Center, you know, and she had uh, 20 people in her lab. And my professor had like three, right? And, but I mean, you know, he had, he was still pulling in money. My tuition was all paid for. A lot of people think that grad school is expensive in computer science. If you're paying for your grad school, you're doing something wrong. Um, like nobody I know paid for grad school in computer science at all. It was free for everybody who wanted it to be. If you wanted to pay, like nobody's going to stop you. But like, you know, you can always, you can always uh, TA. TA equals free money, free tuition. And if you RA, it is also free free money. So if you do research for a professor, they waive your tuition. If you teach a class, they waive your tuition and they pay you cash on top of it. So like nobody in grad school, like was paying tuition except for those that were doing this route where they were, um, they got a job and their job was paying for their MS. They were paying tuition, but nobody, um, nobody like willingly paid money, uh, to go to school in grad school. Bachelors, yeah, like bachelors, they'll suck the money out of you. But grad school, like grad grad students, make the the world go round in academia. So um, yeah, they 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 will they take care of grad students. We had their own we had our own grad lounge and like you know uh, like they treat you really well as a grad student. Undergraduates don't get treated very well in the UCs at least. Community colleges, I think, uh, treat treat people pretty well. Industry research, and then uh, another route that you can take is. Uh, uh, contract work. And I'm curious if everyone needs to be perfect. <laughs> Why it takes me an attorney? <laughs> I have 50 projects. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My, uh, my daughter has a, a desire to be perfect as well, but at a certain point, like you just have to like accept. Yeah. Imperfection sometimes. Yeah. Freelance, freelance work. Uh, it, the route that you can go for that is BS, MS, work for the man for a while and then go freelance. Um, why 
why work for the man if you're going to be freelance? Because you got to know how the industry works. And the uh, the thing is, like, if you're just like a nobody that has no experience, you're not going to get many freelance jobs. Or if you do, they're going to be very low wages because you're competing against everybody with no experience. So you're going to be getting like minimum wage freelance jobs, which is not the right way to go. What you want is to develop a reputation in a certain area, right? So you want to like, you know, have an area, area of, an area of specialization, right? And something that you're known for, something that you're good at. So I was known uh, for doing really good educational research stuff. Like I did a lot of my programs were for education. I would make virtual reality 3D classrooms for students in American history. Uh, and then I did a lot of like uh, quiz testing, stats analysis, database work, attendance tracking, all these things related to K-12 education around the country. I was hired by the college board uh, who do the SAT and the um, AP tests to uh, do the evaluation on um, a new program they're rolling out to try and boost AP enrollment numbers. And so I was given like basically the test data for every student in San Diego County and did an analysis to see if boosting enrollment numbers drop test scores and things like that. And so when you develop a, an area of expertise in an area, then that's when you start getting paid lots of money. And so um, the, um, uh, you know, at, you know, the thing is like how much you get paid hourly oftentimes just depends on how quickly you can work. Right. So if you, uh, if you're offered $50,000 to do work for a certain, you know, you have to do this, you have to produce certain, you know, milestones, you know, if you can get it done in a day, you've made $50,000 in a day, which is pretty good money. It's like Tiger Woods level money. Right. And then you get more of them, right? Uh, but it, you know, if it takes you a year to do that same amount of work, then you've made fifty thousand a year instead of fifty thousand in a day. And so, what I really like about contract work is that the incentives really kind of push you to excel, right? Because you need to do good work because you want the people you're working with to like you and to like your work and to hire you again. But it also pushes you to do it quickly, on time you know, without complaint, going the extra mile, always, right? So even if uh, I only had to like technically work one day on a project I was getting paid 60000 a year for, I would still go in and meet with them and talk with them and communicate with them and go to their events and meet the teachers that, like I didn't have to do any of that stuff, but I did because like it's, you always want to kind of do the extra stuff that, that uh, you know, rather than doing the minimum, you always want to be very expansive and generous and show that you're full of energy and willing to work with them and stuff like that. And people love it. And then they'll hire you again and again. Whereas when you're the sullen person that turns in everything late with the absolute minimum work, they just will fire you or they, maybe they won't fire you, but they won't hire you again. Right. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, and to be fair, Clovis, the Clovis school district, is not good at uh, <laughs> discouraging perfectionism in people. It's really not. Like, the Clovis, the area here really pushes people. Like, you can't, like, I, I was talking to one of the counselors on campus. She's like, I wanted my daughter to just learn to dance for fun, right? Because dancing is fun. And, like, I taught Latin dance the other day, right? It's fun. It's part of the human experience. Like, seeing, uh, singing together, dancing together, making music together, things like that are sort of human universal cultural things and she just wanted her daughter to be able to learn to dance for fun but it was like a sec the second you showed up it's like okay well if you're gonna dance you have to go 200 percent on this you're, we're gonna be doing trips to vegas to do dance competitions you have to live in the studio you can't miss a day you're here five days a week training an hour and a half a day and the counselor's like we don't let people do things for fun anymore right like if you're if you're gonna do fencing like like we do it's like no, we're going to the bay area to do tournaments like you can't just do things for fun everything has to be like this professional um perfectionist you know kind of attitude and I, don't, I don't think it's very healthy honestly like there is nothing wrong with people just doing things for fun you know and then maybe yeah maybe you get into it you're like, oh, this dance thing's cool and i'll do a competition but like 
you know, our, our school district, in my opinion, is really bad for the mental health of um, students. Like it's just, you know, it just, it really pushes students too hard in my opinion. So, um, I actually got three associates cause I keep taking classes for fun. Yeah. That's, that was me in grad school. Like I, I finished all the classes I needed, but like I was, I was being paid to be a TA. I wasn't paying tuition. So I just kept taking classes. I was just like, well, as long as I'm here, you know, I might as well, you know, it's free. Yeah. You know, I might as well learn everything I can. So I took a lot of classes I didn't need to because they were interesting to me, you know, philosophy of science and multimedia system and all this kind of stuff. Orchestra. Yeah. Same thing. I need to dance and sing together in schools, try and audition for musical productions. Rehearsals can be intense. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, contract work. And so basically, um, like when I was, when, when I was at a company, there was this, uh, like 20 something year old, uh, guy who charged a ridiculous amount of money, like a ridiculous amount of money. It was like, I don't know what it was, but it was like 30,000 a day to do contract work and companies in the area would pay him because this guy was really good at one thing. He could come in and look at the, um, diagrams for your, um, circuit board design and he'd look at it and he's like, that's your problem right there. Cause you'd, you'd be having these weird intermittent problems where like the, the video signal would cut out or like the power would fluctuate or, uh, you know, these things weren't talking to these things. And so they would call this guy in and he was just like this 24, 25 year old guy. who was just a surfer dude. And he just was really, really good at one thing. And that was debugging electrical circuits. And he would just come in stare at your circuit diagram. That's the problem. $30,000, please. Thank you. Peace. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, if you, if you can make it fly, like contract work is great. Like, uh, I did it for 12 years. I, like I said, I was, I was making pretty good money, uh, doing it, uh, working on average about 10 hours a week. Some weeks it was a lot of work. Some, sometimes I was working 80 hours a week, a hundred hours a week. Um, but it averaged out to about 10 hours a week. And the rest of the time I'd spend, you know, the pool or with my family or you know, something like that. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's not bad. And now that work from home is like a thing, you know, you can probably get a bit of that contract work life while doing, you know, work from home for a large company. Um, nice. Okay, so that's kind of my spiel on that. Oh, uh, you know, and, and I guess, I guess, I guess, I guess I should mention one more thing, which is starting your own company, right? That's a big one, right? And so small businesses are typically sole proprietorships. which means you're your company. Uh, once you get a little bit bigger, sometimes you form a partnership. Uh, partnerships suck. Don't do them. <laughs> partnerships fall apart all the time. All the time. Like avoid partnerships like the plague. Trust me on this. Um, and then when you get a little bit bigger, you can form like an LLC or you can form something called an S corp, which is what I have myself. And, uh, an S corp is a corporation and it gives you protection from being sued. So if uh, you screw up, they sue the corporation. They don't sue. They don't sue you when you're a sole proprietor, you are your company. They sue you and they can come after your assets. An S corp has a division, the corporate veil between you and your corporate assets. So I have separate accounts for all of my business accounts. I do payroll, um, all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's a learning process. Like learning to run a business is its own, it's its own thing. Right. And, uh, and if you get even bigger then you form what's called a C corp and then you can have like shares of stock. C S corps can have shares of stock too, but they, there's like limitations on it. I think there's an, at most like a hundred shareholders and I don't think they could be publicly traded and things like that. So like the big corporations are all C corps, uh, C corps can retain earnings, um, retain earnings. S-Corps are what are called pass-through entities. Um, 
so what happens with an S corp is that at the end of the year, any money in the corporation flows to the owners and then they have to report it as income on their income taxes. Whereas a C corp can retain earnings and not pass money on to the shareholders or the owners or the employees. And then they pay corporate taxes on it. S corps don't pay corporate taxes because they don't have any income. Like all of the money that comes into an S corp that is retained at the end of the year flows through, it passes through to the owners and then they pay taxes on it themselves. So this is what I have. And if you're a small business, that's probably the right, right way to go. Avoid a partnership like the plague. Uh, they're inherently unstable. They're inherently unstable. One person wants to work harder, but you're splitting the money 50, 50. That's not fair. You know, it's like, you're like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm putting in a hundred hours a week. You're putting in 10. We should at least be splitting this 75, 25. Hey, that's not fair. You're trying to edge me out of my own corporation. Blah, 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 blah. They're inherently unstable. You have six people in a corporation. It's going to disintegrate at some point. Like it's they're just avoid them. Like S corps where you have a president and you've got shareholders and you can have votes and things like that is actually more stable than a, than a partnership. Um, and sole proprietorships are great too. So like, you know, if, if you're, if you're not making that much money, like start with a sole proprietorship, it costs like there's something called a DBA. Um, a DBA is doing business as, and so you can set up a doing business as I am, uh, Bill Kearney presents, you know, and so you, you, uh, you file a DBA, which is a very cheap thing you can file with the, the government. And then you have a name for your company. Um, like any of these gardening companies, like, you know, WK, you know, gardening or whatever. A lot of those are just DBAs. Like they're not corporations. They're just, it's a person doing business as, you know, Wells Fargo consultants or whatever, you know? And so this is fine as long as you're not making that much money. Once you're making good money, you really need to incorporate and, uh, you know, obviously talk to your lawyer, talk to your tax specialist. Uh, don't listen to me. I'm a computer science major. What do I know? But I've gone, I've gone through this whole process myself. I've started up many businesses and, you know, some of them have succeeded. Uh, some of them have failed. Um, you know, uh, sometimes like just the business deals just doesn't go through. Like, you know, we got to a point where we had everybody ready to go and like nobody could agree on the percentages. Right. And then we're like, walk away from it. Right. Cause if, if you're offering me $2,000 a year to participate on a project, it's not enough money for me. Right. I'm not, I, I'm not going to get out of bed for $2,000. It's just not enough money or $5,000. Like, no, like, you, you need to, you need to have enough money to motivate me to get out of bed in the morning. And so, um, and so like if somebody offers me half a percentage and I'm going to be working hundreds of hours a year on it, I'm like, no, nah, unless it's Facebook or something, you know? So, you know, sometimes these things just don't materialize. Sometimes they do, and then they fall apart. Sometimes they're successful. And the really nice thing about starting your own corporation is that you heart your boss. Right. When you start your own business, you like your boss. Your boss is a pretty awesome dude or, or chick or whatever. You know, I'm from San Diego. Everybody's either a chick or a dude. Um, <laughs> right. Like I get along fine with my boss and my corporation. Right. He's me. So um, you're from San Diego, too. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about. So, uh, you know, I go to business meetings and a person's in a suit in Birkenstocks, you know, in sandals. Completely un, un, unremarkable. Um, so this is honestly just a really nice way of going through life, by the way. If you can manage it, um, starting your own business, you find a niche. You know, there's there's usually some, some niche that uh, has not been filled yet. And there's a lot of those out. There's a lot of companies also, but there's a lot of niches that haven't been filled yet. You find something that nobody else is doing, and you hit that niche hard, and you make money, and you get to run a business and all the upside is yours. That's the other great thing. The, the upside is yours. What does that mean? My neighbor, when I was growing up, he invented a new, uh, antenna for cell phones, wildly successful, made his company a billion dollars, something like that. Some huge amount of money. I don't know. And as thanks for him for inventing this antenna, uh, they, uh, they had a little reception for him and they had a little mini bar, you know, with like some chopped pineapples and stuff. 
and they gave him a extra week of vacation, all expense paid trip to Hawaii. And he was so happy. And I was just sitting there going like, he made you guys a billion dollars. Like, you know, you can't even be, you can't get, like, give him two weeks in Hawaii, you know what I mean? Like, get, get him some of that, the, the Waikiki, you know, on, on the beach, you know, like, a week, really? That's, that's it, you know? The upside was all the businesses, right? Because he was working for them. And so when they hit the jackpot, all of the upside goes to the company. And they were nice. They didn't have to give him a, a week in, in Honolulu, right? They didn't have to. They probably wanted to keep him around in case, you know, the golden rooster would lay another golden egg or something. You know, the golden hen, probably roosters don't lay eggs. But um, when you're the boss of the company, all the upside is yours, right? So if you make a software product that takes off, you get to keep all the profit, which is really nice. It is, uh, we don't like to say no to this company. It's funny. Um, right? Like if, if you, if you make a game on your own and it sells a million copies at 10 bucks each, that's $10 million minus the cut of steam and whatever that goes to you. All the upside is yours. It's nice. It's really nice. And, uh, you know, there have definitely been days where I've made, you know, over $30,000 a day. Um, and all of it I get to keep because I'm the boss, right? It's really nice. It's really nice. So, um, if you're going to start your incorporation though, I, you need to put in the time you need to put in the effort and the, uh, the killer thing here is that there are like a lot of hats. So not only do you have to be good at tech, right? Your tech, you have to have like a five star, you know, rating on tech. Like you have to have your tech game on point. Like you gotta, you gotta put in your time. You do the BS, the job, the MS, like you have to develop your skills to a high level of, you know, you have to develop your skills, like trust me. But then in addition to like being amazing at tech, you have to be good at like HR stuff and like people management, right? Hiring, firing, you know, consultants, employees, that kind of stuff. Um, you have to, know enough about taxes or you like hire a CPA, you know, but like you have to know enough not to like get in trouble with the IRS, right? You have to know stuff about the law. And at some point you'll have a corporate attorney like I do. But you still have to know enough not to get yourself in trouble because the lawyer is not looking over your shoulder every time you send an email to somebody. So you have to develop a certain minimal level of proficiency of understanding of the law. You have to understand taxes and accounting. Um, uh, taxes and accounting kind of goes along with that. Accounting plus taxes. Uh, you kind of have to understand how to keep track of receipts. What's a business expense? What's not a business expense? What's writable? Uh, what are accountable reimbursements? Like all this kind of stuff. There is a huge learning curve to like running an actual business and how do you like shares of stock work and like percentage ownership? How does that work? Right. Um, hiring is an area skill. Yeah. It's really important though. Like you have to find the right people, you know? And that's one of the reasons why networking is so important. And then I should put this down too. I'm not talking about computer networking. I'm talking about like networking with people. Like I know enough people that like when I need to hire somebody to do something that I don't want to do, I know somebody that can do it and they can do it well and on time and on budget and things like that. It's one of the upsides of being a social individual is it like you just know people. And uh, so I'm like, hey, uh, you know, how would you like to have a job? You know, I'm offering $5,000 for a week's worth of work. Sure. There you go. Um, there's just all these different hats that you have to wear. What else? Um, facilities like... Um, like if you're gonna have an office and things like that, like if you're, if you're gonna have a storefront, like that's an entire, like retail is its own nightmare. Like I've never, like I, I worked in a public facing, uh, business once, you know, if you ever do retail work, my Lord, you know, and there's like customer service. Oh goodness. Uh, like that's, that's an entire nightmare, you know? processing refunds and like 
how do you run credit cards and and like people come in to complain you know to the manager and stuff like that uh yeah no when i work with people i work directly with like school districts like i don't i don't have any like frontages i don't have a place where people can come up no i just talk to people directly you know it's a lot easier that way you manage restaurants <laughs> i'm sorry um no i'm kidding i'm kidding it's a great it's a great job but i wouldn't want to do it um <laughs> Uh, yeah, retail customer. Like, there's just so many different things you have to know to start a business, and that's one of the reasons why people will do partnerships. Like a tech person will partner with a with a uh, corporate person. You know, the Steve Wozniak partners with the Steve Jobs, but then what always happens is the Steve Jobs takes all the company, and the tech person gets sidelined with a little pat on the head and a boot out the door. So, uh, you know, <laughs> um, you know, like it, it's a tale as old as time. Like. Somebody will come to a tech person saying like, hey, could you make this product for me? We'll split it 50-50. And then you make the product for them and suddenly they own the company and you, you get nothing, right? Even though you did all the work, right? So, um, you know, law, contracts. <laughs> contracts are so huge. Having a good contract is life and death. Um, biggest mistake of my life was trusting Joe Farley, who's currently the superintendent of schools in Irvine. At the time, he was superintendent of schools in Oceanside. And he hired me to write a grant for his um, school district, Oceanside. And uh, hired for free, you know, basically on spec. Basically, I write the grant, and if the grant funds, I work on the grant. And I was in for 100000 a year for five years. So we're talking $500,000. It's like a house, like level of money. And the grant funds. I'm like, sweet. And then Joe Farley turns it down. I'm like, what? Why would you turn? It's $5 million to Oceanside and half a million to me. Like, what the hell, dude? Why, why are you turning it down? He's like, oh, well, I hired two people to do it. And they both funded. And the state had to pick which one I wanted to keep. And I want to keep the other one. So, bye-bye. I'm like, you son of a... <laughs> really? You hired, he's like, well, it didn't cost me anything, you know, so why not? I was like, that's 500,000. And I looked at my contract that I had signed with him and said, if the grant gets funded, they owe me this money, but he chose not to have the grant funded. So my lawyer looked at it, he's like, yeah, not a whole lot you can do there. You know, I was like, <laughs> it costed you your honor yeah yeah that was not very cash money of you that's what i should have told him that was not very cash money of you half a million dollars that that cost me and if i had just been a little bit on point with the contract you know and just put in there like you can't turn it down or you know something like that like because it didn't even occur to me right like it didn't occur to me that like somebody would turn down five million dollars in their pocket and and what kind of asshole like has two people do the same thing like it even it, the the level of perfidy didn't even occur to me, you know, and that's what lawyers are really good at. They they understand perfidy very well. You know, I'm being sarcastic here, but um, you know, my corporate lawyer's like, you should have had me look at this before you sent off a contract to somebody. I'm like, well, I thought I was pretty good at it. He's like, you should have had me look at it beforehand, and we could have gone through some of these scenarios that might have happened. I'm like, uh, this has never happened to me before. It wouldn't have occurred to me then. He's like, yeah, you know, you're probably right. It probably would have happened anyway. Villain arc, yeah. So, hmm. yeah, true story. And, you know, there have been times like that where it's like, you, generally speaking, anytime you have a contract, you want your lawyer to look at it before you send it off because uh, they will screw you on the contract. Like about a third of the time, people are on the up and up. About a third of the time, they like you and they'll go above and beyond for you. About a third of the time, they're going to try and hose you. And that's when you need your contract, like an ironclad, like guaranteed proof. The the thirty the thirty three percent in the middle like yeah you also want to have a contract because it's like I do this you do this and we're both happy right uh, with the people who are wonderful like sometimes they'll just throw you money like hey do you want an extra five thousand dollars like sure that sounds good to me I would like five thousand dollars thank you very much They're like well you just need to you know make this one thing for us and bill us five thousand like sure sounds good boop here you go five thousand thank you very much but like for the one third that are trying to screw you 
you absolutely have to have a lawyer look at those contracts in black and white and blood and think about every possible way they can try and hose you on it. You know, it's very important. It's very important. Don't don't skimp on the lawyers. Like really, it's a bad idea. If there's any sort of money involved at all, you need to you need to have a lawyer. You know, and and again, like I said, you have to yourself develop enough skill with the law that like you don't um, make mistakes like when just sending a casual email. Oh sure, we'll do that. You know, and now you've committed your company to doing something for free. Maybe you know that's hundreds of hours of work. Um, so you have to, you have to be very cautious about what you say on emails. Uh, don't commit to things you're not going to do. Uh, at, and then at the same time, like when they send you emails, you archive all of them. So you have a record of everything. It's so like when, uh, when Maricopa tried to screw me over, they had a, uh, uh, they had a uh, financial, um, irregularity, let's put it in their district as far as money, uh, vanishing somehow i don't know the details i'm not accusing them of any crimes but they had some uh, shortfalls all of a sudden in the phoenix area uh they tried firing me off of a project because they had to come up with a hundred thousand dollars real fast you know and they would be a hundred thousand dollars so well like, we're just not gonna pay you and i'm like no how about you do pay me you know and they're like but we don't want to pay you and i'm like that's why i have a contract you're gonna pay me you know, and here's the contract. You, you got, you, I do these things. I've done all these things. You got to do these things. And one of those things is you pay me money, you know, and, uh, um, <laughs> your parents, it's funny. It was an edge case. I never thought of. Yeah, exactly. And it's still like to this day, like I'm, I'm still mad about it, you know? Uh, but like who could have thought that would happen? Right. Um, and so like the Phoenix people, the Maricopa County technically, which is the donut around Phoenix. Uh, they're like, yeah, you're in breach of contract. I'm like, for what? You know, they're like, well, you didn't send us an email or something. Like, we sent you an email and you didn't respond to it. I'm like, what email? They're like, I don't know. I'm like, do you have a copy of the email? If you send me a copy of the email, I can see if I got it or not in my records. They're like, well, we can't find the email we sent to you. I'm like, oh, that's cool. So the email that I didn't respond to, it's on your outbox. It's not, it doesn't exist. They're like, well, we sent it to you. You didn't respond. So you're in breach. I'm like, what are you talking? Like everything was set up. Like, you know, I didn't, I did all my bullet points and basically I had to sue them because they were, they were doing, they fired other people off the grant and those people rolled over on their backs. Oh, you don't want me on the grant. Okay. You can have a hundred thousand dollars back. I'm like, why are you doing this? Don't give them a hundred thousand dollars. This is like, they're, they're probably engaged in some sort of financial I don't know, malfeasance of some sort. I don't know. I, I, I don't have any knowledge. I'm not accusing them of anything. It just kind of seems that way to me. Um, why are you giving them the money? You need the money more than they do. They're a giant school district, you know? And they're like, well, they said they don't need me. So I'm just going to like let them cancel the contract on me. I'm like, you're an idiot. Like, no, don't do that. You know? And so I hired a lawyer and we went to court and we had mandatory, um, mandatory mediation. Um, and I walked in and this is why I'm saying you have to archive all of your emails with your clients. I walked in with a printout of every communication I'd had with them, including like one from February saying, all right, you're scheduled to come out in August and perform your duties in August. I'm like, cool. And then I sent him a, uh, you know, follow up in March. We're still on. Yep. All right, cool. And then in June, um, I sent him an email saying, Hey, we're still on for August. Right. And they're like, you're in breach. I'm like, what? Like, well, you know, we tried contacting you and you didn't respond. So, you know, you're in brief. I'm like, I, you know, and I just sat down and it showed like, here's all the, everything set up. There were no things for me to do in the meantime. I was just contacting them to make sure they weren't doing some nonsense like this, you know? And the lawyer looks at all my stuff. He looks at them. He's like, all right, do you have a copy of that email that you said that you sent to him? And which doesn't really matter anyway, because the person not responding to an email is not a breach of contract anyway, but do you have any evidence that you sent him an email that didn't exist? And they're like, no. And they had a giant folder. Like, cause you win court cases on paperwork, right? They had this giant folder. I'm like, what is in that folder? It's not in the email, you know? Like, I don't even know what's in there, you know? And they're like, no, we couldn't find it. And so he's like, asking me, did you see it? I'm like, I didn't see it. You know, it might've gotten spam filtered or something. If they'd been able to provide me the email, I could have looked or something, but 
as far as I can tell, they're just lying about it. He's like, eh, kind of seems that way, huh? Um, okay, so in summary, you sent an email that didn't actually exist to him, and he didn't respond to an email that didn't exist, so who cares? Um, he had set up all the things, he had done everything on the grant, you're just arbitrarily canceling the grant, 100% for Kearney, plus full lawyer's expenses. Boom. And so I was awarded not only all of the money that was due to me that year, I was awarded all of the money me, all the money due to me for the entire rest of the contract period because I didn't have to work with them anymore. I didn't have to do any work for them. They just had to hand me a big hundred thousand dollar check. Boom! Here you go. And on top of that, they paid the twenty thousand dollars or whatever it was that my lawyer charged. And uh, and even though that was mediation or arbitration or one of those things, I can't remember which. We could have gone to a real case, but they had nothing. Like they had zero. And I won because I had all of my emails archived. I don't delete any of my emails with clients. Everything was in, everything was in order. Here's everything I have. Here's my contract. They had, they had nothing. They had literally nothing for the case. And, and I still to this day don't know what was in that giant, like three ring binder. Like, here's our evidence. We slam it on the table and I'm like, what's in there? There's like, what is that? Like, yeah, <laughs> what do you have there? I'm curious. I'm still to this day curious what they actually had in there because they didn't have anything useful as far as anyone could tell. And the lawyer was like, yeah, here you go. hundred percent. Kearney, boom, you don't have to work anymore. You're going to get paid for not working, and the lawyer gets 100%. And you can appeal this to the uh, you know court if you want. I'm improvising here. You didn't actually say this, but that's basically what the letter said, you know. And uh, uh, you, you tell, like, the, the look on their corporate lawyer's face was like, yeah, they weren't going to appeal that because they had, like, they didn't have anything. Right, and they were just trying to hope that I wouldn't show up or I would settle with them or something like that. And I was like, oh, hell no. Oh, hell no, I'm not settling for anything. <laughs> you know, so the entire B-movie script was in there. <laughs> um, allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. Yeah, I, I don't have any firsthand information. I've heard all sorts of allegations. I have no actual knowledge of what was going on there. All I know is that all of a sudden they got real hungry for money. And they were firing people that had contracts with left and right. And I was the only person, as far as I know, that was actually like, how about I say no to that? You know? And that's why I have a contract. You know? It's very important. It's very important. And so, uh, yeah, my lawyer is like, yeah, well done. You know, like, you did everything right. Um, good job preserving all of your emails. Good job being very neutral. Every time I sent them an email, I was like, hey... What else can I do? I'm ready to perform. Oh, you're canceling me for August. Um, why don't we make it up in September? Like I was never like on my part, I was never like, okay, fine. I'm not going to do the work. It was always like, I want to do the work. I want, I'm ready to perform. I'm ready to perform the work. Just let me know when I need to do my bullet points. And they're like, no, 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 you don't come in. I'm like, mm, I have a contract. I'm supposed to come in. I got to do my bullet point. They're, you're in breach. Lossy time. Win. So, um, yeah, that, that, was, that was, it was very stressful, by the way. I don't recommend going through that. Um, but it was still like, there was just this great sense of like justice and like vindication afterwards. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm still a little mad at Maricopa Cat, but uh, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, we got him. So uh, basically that's, uh, that's our lecture for today. Um, the, uh, uh, any other questions about this? Uh, I guess we can do game development on, on Wednesday or something like that. Um, getting kicked out of Facebook, yeah. Any questions about starting your own business? Trials and tribulations of an individual one programmer? Finding the man? Maricopa County, Arizona. Yeah, like, there's there's a lot of stuff that goes on there. Um, the the uh, um, superintendent of Maricopa County Schools was famous for taking off her shoes in the uh, Board of Education meetings and putting her feet up on the table and having her pedicurist come in and give her a pedicure, like painting her toenails, like filling the uh, conference room with like, you know, the toxic, um, you know, gases of like, you know, the the nail paint and things like that while people are trying to have like a, a meeting like she's just sitting there like getting her, her nails did you know um 
Yeah, like there, there's all sorts, like, like I said, there's all allegedly, I have no first-hand knowledge of any of this. I just heard a lot of things from like a lot of people when I was there. So I'm just passing on unsubstantiated rumors, all of you. So, all right, what are the websites to practice coding? Hack rank, leak code. Yeah, let's write that down. Uh, yeah, it, it was uh, the whole thing. It's the whole thing going on there. Um, so hacker rank, lead code, and code wars. And code wars, there is a Clovis Community College team, and I can post the link for that on Canvas, and then you can join the team, and you can see how well your fellow Clovis Community College uh, students are doing on the assignments. Uh, I think that, um, was Hazleton here a second ago? I think Hazleton actually has a higher score than me on it. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, it was a, it was a weird, weird experience. And uh, it was, it was really sad too, because like I had this really good relationship with the, uh, with the districts and all this kind of stuff. They had this uh, project director. They flew in from like, um, like this, like her previous job was at the Smithsonian. She was an absolutely wonderful person, and they fired her because uh, they didn't have any money. So, like suddenly, the, like they had money from the government for the grant. It was just kind of weird. Like all of a sudden, they fired her and replaced her with a district administrator. It's kind of weird. And then he started firing everybody. It's just kind of weird. It's a weird coincidence. Who knows what's happening? Okay, so that's it for today, guys. Thanks a lot for coming out, and I shall see you all on Wednesday. So, think of any ideas you guys want to know about. We talk about hacking. We talk about game development. A lot of stuff. So I'm just post it on the post it on uh, Discord. I'll uh, improvise something for you guys. All right. Peace out.